Okay, before I put the, the swarf guard, the slash guard back on, I thought I'd quickly show you how this power track came up, and I'm, I'm really happy with, uh, with how this is, uh, is looking. Um, I've got good protection for the cables inside, and they feed out quite nicely away from the action. Uh, I put slack in to the cables before they feed into the, uh, into the power track, and they're also all clipped off, so they're, they're fixed. Uh, they're not going to be um, getting caught up in anything. Uh, this particular power track is a completely or completely enclosed, unlike the one I've got on my other lathe, which has the slats in it. And every six months I've got to get in there with a pair of needle nose pliers and, and pick out a lot of the swarf. So this works out okay on this lathe. I'm going to buy one and put it on the other lathe, take away that headache. Just mounted down with a simple bracket. It's got that down at uh, my local Bunnings there, and just uh, configured it to uh, to act as a um, um, a tail bracket to lock the uh, lock the power track in. Everything's come up nice and easy. The power track is obviously self-supporting without any issues. Um, we'll give it a run backwards and forwards and we'll come back and have a look at this uh, bit of conglomeration of bits of angle and stuff that I had lying around and I was able to re-machine and reconfigure up into uh, into supports for this, uh, this power track. Let's give it a quick actuation up and down. It's fully to the headstock. And that's all the way back. It keeps everything just very tidy. I've also made allowance that I can put a coolant hose up inside here if I want it to feed up to where the coolant uh, pipe gets clamped onto. But uh, I'm going to leave the coolant off just for the time being. All right, let's go have a closer look at this uh, configuration we've got up here. All right, so I've just got bits of angle that I've had lying around and just uh, machined and modified it to suit. Um, this is cut around to uh, allow the, uh, the clamping block for the coolant pipe to go up through. It's just a bit of 40 by 40 angle that I had. This is the same angle section that I used to make up the support for the uh, for the reed head. And all I've done there is just milled out an opening to allow the cables to go up inside. And I've just uh, bolted on a uh, an angle for the uh, for the plastic clips to, to hold into place. So nothing fancy. Um, unlike the other lathe, I've made the reed head mount and the cable track mount totally independent. So. If this gets jammed up or anything happens to it, it's not going to affect the reed head in any way. Job just about done there. Um, what I am going to do with the cables coming out, I've got some electrical uh, conduit, some of the flexible electrical conduit I'm going to split and fit around this cable so I can run it outside the, the splash tray and give it some final protection before it gets out there. Um, these are obviously too short, so I've bought some extension cables for these. Uh, exact same extension cables I've been running on my other lathe, so we'll show you that when we've got them uh, mounted up into place after the splash guards here. Alright, while we're here, let's just have a look at some of the other things I've done. I've put a bump stop on here just to protect the tail stop coming up and bumping into that cable because it is a pinch point. So it'll just slide up and hit the bumper. And uh, protect quite well. So I'm happy with that. I've only just contacted he's of that under place. Other little job I've done, I've, I've taken the readout. I've got an extension cable for a little ribbon cable for this uh, little readout that, uh, that mounts into the, uh, into the converter and mount it up there so I can see what speed I'm doing. I've actually changed the motor configuration um, to an eight pole motor. So I'm over speeding this, uh, this motor up to 100 hertz. That gives me um, full speed and 50 hertz is, is half speed. So it's quite easy to work out um, what your speed ranges are. And we'll have a little potentiometer pop right beside it. Now you might notice I've got the uh, Essing readout unit sitting up here, DRO readout unit, as opposed to the Sino. Now I did do some uh, checks on this, and over the four millimeters, it hit every 0.1 of a mil absolutely bang on. There was absolutely no drift, unlike the Sino you just saw in my previous video. It drifted around about 0.02 of a millimeter. Uh, over four millimeters and then came back to zero. So it drift off and then drift back every four millimeters. Now, you know, that's 
that's seven tenths of a thou. Um, normally you, you wouldn't even worry about it. But I had this uh, I had this spare that came off the milling machine. You can see in the background there the old Victoria mill. So I've mounted it up onto here, and as I said, it's uh, it's dead nuts spot on when I can compare that back to my uh, my precision dial indicator. That's uh, I think it's a one micron indicator. So I might do a little video just showing how that uh, how that does hit every mark on the way through. One thing I have done with the power cable off the back of the DRO is I've hardwired it back into the control cabinet uh, inside, so it's uh, it's permanently on when the machine is uh, is turned on. You know, obviously you can turn it off individually here, but uh, it was a lot neater doing it that way rather than trying to mount a power point up here to be able to plug it into. It was just easy to hardwire it off. Right, oh, I'm going to look at putting that um, flexible conduit around this to protect it, but slitting it down one side and trying to open it up, that was nearly impossible. So what I've done is I've been able to cut halfway through the ribs from the top, so just continue to cut through. It creates like a clamshell and it can be buttoned together. So this is the one I've done. I'm going to feed that on and uh, close it up and uh, clip it together and we'll see how we look. But I reckon that's going to be quite well. It's going to afford it a little bit more protection as it does come out um, before it goes onto the uh, cable tray back here and I run the cables up um, as they are on their own. Alright, so we've got that all in and clipped off. I've used these little stainless steel bands and uh, they're quite good actually. They give a bit of a professional finish too, but inside the clasp here is a, a little bearing and uh, you feed the head in and it locks. You can't pull it back. A little bit like a, like a cable tie, but in stainless steel. So I'll go one way but won't go the other. So uh, that's what I've used. I'll trim all these tails off here and um, I'm probably going to butt it up against there so that it's sitting up off the top so it's easy to sweep the swarp away. I hate having stuff clipped down here and you're trying to work swarp in around it. So we'll get that up out of the way and then we'll run the cables up the swarp tray. Alright, so that's electrical conduit, um, flexible conduit in place. I've just used a uh, electrical saddle there for that conduit and it's clipped in quite hard there. Um, it's neatened it up an awful lot I reckon. I reckon it looks beaut. And I've got no issues with full travel on that either. Alright, let's get this uh, splash guard in place. And um, I'll see everything is up, eh? All right, I just thought I'd quickly show you these um, stainless steel cable ties that I've used. So I've got those down at my local Bunnings. 4.6 millimetres by 250 millimetres long, and you just cut them off the length. And um, like I said, it looks quite professional when it's all done. Okay, I just quickly thought I'd show you how I'm just clipping this cable up um, inside the, uh, the folded ridge of the splash guard here. I'm just using cable ties, just drilling through, clipping them up inside, holding the cable up into place, which is fine for along here, but when I get further on up, I want to lock it down so it can't move and stays in place. I've got an issue when I open this door up, I don't want this cable falling down inside and I don't want it slackening off where it can fall inside. So I'll show you a little tip that I'm using to uh, just utilize these TPS cable clips, which is a standard household wiring clips that you hold in place. And uh, I'll show you how we're locking uh, the cable into place with those. Okay, so these are the clips I'm using. I just bought these down at my local Bunning store. They're just standard TPS uh, 2.5 millimeter cable clips that uh, you use to pin cable off uh, around the house, uh, inside the, uh, the wall cavities, uh, up against the framework. So I take the nail out and then drill them out. And I just fit an M3 socket head cap screw into place. The problem is with them as they are at the moment is that the cable is quite loose. It doesn't grip the cable and hold the cable. It just guides it but it doesn't actually hold it. So what I've done is I've just grabbed a bit of the uh, 3 core TPS that's uh, 
power neutral on earth and uh, just cut a section of that off and just with a standing off slit it and remove the cables out of the inside of it and you end up with a little sheath like that and that little sheath will just clip around your cables quite neatly and you can put your clip over the top and it just manages to fit if I can find where the hole is I'll screw it into place it down and that, that holds that cable quite nicely in place now. Uh, it's not going to back off and it guides it quite well as well. And there's probably stuff on the market that you can buy specifically for doing this but um, at a pinch, uh, nice and cheap. I had a heap of these clips left over from some previous work and a heap of TPS left over as well. So easy to make up a little uh, little guide and a little clamp for those, uh, for those cables. Alright guys, this is it. We're all together. And I'm about to make the first chips. So I actually haven't run this lathe in cutting mode. So this will be the first time. So I'm gonna do a just over a six inch length here and we'll see what the parallelism is like on the, on the headstock to start with. And I wanna do a little check to see if there's any issues with the headstock bearings, if we need to do any adjustments on those taper rollers. So fingers crossed. It actually does what it's supposed to do. I've got a bit of two-inch stock in here. It's it's an odd feeling being able to poke that all the way up inside the nose. So, uh, all right. Let's get it up on the tripod and uh, let's see how it performs. <laughs> 